Okay, well, let's, um, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be moderating the um, challenges of, for lenders for optimizing their funding today. My name is Anna Harper, I'm CFO of Claire Match. I'm joined by a very um, senior and um, experienced panel today. So I'd like to start with maybe every panelist could just give a brief um, introduction, uh, just a brief bio and also just an introduction to the company that they're representing. Keith, we'll start with yourself. Thanks, Anna. Uh, Keith Rodwell, I'm with 255 Finance, which is a part of Challenger. Uh, the background is in um, the finance company sector, many years across a number of commercial and consumer finance products, and uh, 255 is really looking to combine the, uh, the funding, the non-bank non capital available through Challenger and the uh, uh, retirement income space uh, with the finance company experience of actually operating in the world of uh, consumer finance, accounts receivables finance, equipment finance. Thank you. Philippe? Uh, Philippe Roger. Um, I've been a private investor in this um, alternative uh, finance space for the last uh, eight years. Um, I've started uh, HHR Capital Partners with uh, uh, two of the nice guys uh, here today <laughs> and um, with the aim of providing uh, fund management and advisory service services to this um, asset class. And prior to that, uh, I was uh, running uh, structured credit trading uh, at JP Morgan. Thank you, Philippe. John? Uh, my name is John Cummins. Um, I'm Chief Investment Officer at Society One. I have been for the last 15 months. Uh, Society One, for those who don't know, is predominantly a consumer loan provider. Um, we also do some lending in the agriculture sector. Um, my background is predominantly uh, uh, investment banking on the financial market side um, in the sort of derivatives, credit, fixed income, predominantly euros. Uh, it's my second round today, so um, <laughs> some of you may have uh, recognised me. Um, I'm Richard Bloomberg. I'm uh, the managing director and also was involved in starting up Now Finance, which is part of the Wingate Group. Um, my background is in, uh, in uh, financial services and investment banking, where I've been involved in, um, in that industry for close to 30 years. Um, at uh, Now Finance, we are personal loan specialists and, um, and uh, very focused on building out our brand and our position in the market. Thank you. Um, well, we've got, uh, it's, a, it's a great mix. We've got actually, speaking about the challenges of funding, we have two funders on the panel today and two um, predominantly consumer lending um, uh, lenders in, in, um, uh, with, with difference in their business models that we'll talk about in detail a bit further down. So looking at the growing challenge um, for non-bank lenders and alternative um, finance lenders, um, there are many, th th there's access, um, there's actual challenges for the access to diversified funding um, and actually ac accessing adequate funding. So I'll jump straight to Keith um, really on looking at how you, how you assess the loan portfolio, so mostly in consumer finance space. Um, what do you look at when you assess the loan portfolio of say a more mature market and a traditional lender? versus uh, an alternative finance lender, like a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace lender. So there's probably a few questions here, a few questions in here, is firstly, what's the, how do you assess the loan portfolio, and then when is it actually good, when is it mature enough for the funder to invest? I'll, I'll talk and hopefully I'll answer some questions along the way. Um, yeah, we, we sort of think about it a little bit differently in that um, we look at, uh, our, our role is to sit really in spaces where the banks and the capital markets don't sit. So traditionally that would be um, larger, more established portfolios. Um, and that typically comes with age and with the homogeneity of the asset class. Um, Securitisation is by far a, a, an efficient um, source of capital, uh, but it has requirements. And um, the, the challenge for every um, finance company is how do I get to that size uh, to take advantage of it. What we've done is to mix the access to capital with a skill set from people who have come out of the finance company space so that we, we will take first dollar of loss. Um, so we'll look at things either as a portfolio or an individual deal. We look at things as if we were doing that business ourselves. 
Um, we've run businesses and, and I sort of look at it and say, if I had a subsidiary, would I do that type of business? Would I do it that way? Um, and if, if we get to the positive answer on that, uh, then I'm happy to fund that business, whether that's funding them at 100% of their um, funding needs or at some um, senior level, depending on their capital structure. So clearly, different business models, and particularly at the moment in the fintech space, we see uh, the capital light uh, models, uh, as well as traditional balance sheet models that are, uh, are, are more uh, pronounced with equity, and, um, and therefore you've got the capital to, uh, to build the business and build uh, traditional funding sources. So, um, you know, we look at it differently a across those different spectrums, whether it's the maturity of the business, uh, the nature of the receivable. Uh, some receivables are short term, the tenor of those, some are longer term, some have got different risk profiles. All of those factors go into uh, what funding sources are open to you. Uh, and uh, the other thing I would say is obviously within those funding sources, uh, each of the funders have a different objective, a different appetite. Um, and a scale, and so therefore the challenge is picking the right funder at the right stage of development for your company. Mm, that's, a, that's very interesting. So a quick follow-up question on that, speaking of the maturity and also capital light and, and traditional balance sheet lending, what's your, how do you assess the credit enhancement that, what's the differences of, uh, that you'd look for in credit enhancement provided by traditional lenders, and then as opposed to say peer-to-peer -peer marketplace lenders who have light, light capital? Yeah, so I, I look at it, um, you know, we have peer-to-peer uh, -peer models at 100% of the uh, capital structure and we also have direct models at 100% of the capital structure. So it's not really whether it's peer-to-peer -peer or, um, or, or the finance structure. It tends to be um, when you look at the capital structure from, first of all, from a risk point of view, clearly there's a, uh, a risk enhancement that has both a, um, an alignment of interest with the platform and, and with the, the partner, um, and also a, a, a response to that in terms of the cost of the capital. Um, however, uh, when we look at 100% uh, of the funding structure, um, we are still looking for alignment in other ways, and, and we still are reliant on that partner for both origination and servicing. Um, so w we look for alignment, but we also look to underwrite the deal. So not having um, the first loss capital piece isn't necessarily the end of the story. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, speaking of light capital, John, I might jump to you. Um, could you just give us a bit of an introduction to Society One, how the business model works, and um, you, is w what sort of challenges and funding that you look at or that, you, that you're in, ad addressed with? Sure, so um, for those... Uh, uh, OFA with uh, probably the, the more established models around the world, um, certainly um, pioneered uh, largely in, in the US and the UK. Um, there's the, I suppose, the established models at the moment, the fractionalised model um, and the whole loan model um, in terms of what you're pushing out to investors, um, particularly in the, in the consumer uh, personal loan sector. Um, and, and for those, as I said, who, who are aware of uh, how that's developed overseas, both still exist. Um, some run both, um, and I think, you know, I always <laughs> people sort of sit down and they go, which one works better? Um, and and at the end of the day, they're now both quite well established. Um, as I said, people, some some companies run them in tandem. We run a fractionalised model. Um, they both work. Um, they both have their pluses and they both have their minuses. So, it, it's it's an interesting. Th th there's no doubt that 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 we benefited um, a few years ago um, from having our in-house technology that developed it. Um, so we could certainly create a bespoke model as the industry developed over here. Um, it gave us scale, there's no doubt about that. And it allows you to um, combine um, large uh, cornerstone, if you like, investors with uh, smaller um, high net worth or depending on what your, 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 your license allows you to do. Um, it, so in the sense of, of, of starting the business in a, in a, in a in a country where you're so heavily dominated in the consumer sector by the banks, um, and who really don't care, um, to be honest, about um, the fact that it's got both sides. You know, they're one side, and the borrower's the other side. So y you, the interesting thing about that is you're always caring about both sides, um, and as I said, they have their vagaries, um, but there's no doubt that certainly we enjoyed a um, a good run, enjoying a good run 
um, in employing fractionalization or deploying fractionalization, but I wouldn't, I, I would never be, I don't think, stupid enough to say one's better than the other. Or would, and, and sort of you look forward to, they have different, um, uh, they, they have different effects as you move and you evolve from the, I suppose, the traditional peer to peer model to a marketplace because you are taking on larger funders. I can tell you that from personal experience. Um, they have different needs. Um, and deployment of funds is, is critical. It's, as I said, it's not like a bank. You're running a marketplace and everybody wants to ensure that they're playing at all times. So, you know, the, the, the reality is is that um, I think, it's personally think anyway, that uh, in this country now, there's we've learnt a lot from the mistakes of our overseas partners and uh, or people we know overseas and I think that that um, points to both sides or both methodologies uh, growing going forward. Sure. Thank you John. Well Society One is probably one of the um, last ones in the world that does pure fractionalization and as it's recently announced in the media it's over 400 million in funding now so what would be your um, really key takeaways and also just from your pers personal view uh, let's say comparing from your experience to fig wh how different is it what what would be really what would be in summary your takeaways on fractionalization versus balance sheet or also versus just institutional funding well, look, there's no doubt that um, we, we enjoy, uh, at the institutional level, um, very traditional investors, um, people who want a pretty smooth coupon every month, quarter. Um, that's very hard to manufacture in the early years of the business because you enjoy a origination period followed by a write-off period followed by a recovery period that does become smooth, but um, you have to bring those investors along the journey. Um, so from, from that point of view, that's something we've probably been through in the last two years, but the two years before that we enjoyed a, a fabulous sort of run up, and now we have a, a, a much smoother path, if you like, and an understanding of how each cohort's going to behave. Um, we've never been, the industry's never been through an upward interest rate cycle yet. Um, society one has to deal with that, but so does the industry. So I, I think, our problems are the industry problems when they when and if they come because I think we're not as I said there's a certain homogeneity in there now um, there are there is choice and there are some established players so um, whilst we um, do compete I guess with some of the traditional um, I suppose fixed income and credit providers um, we also see you know I've probably seen four this year new star wealth managers or funds come in who particularly want to play in the marketplace sector or in the fin as they call it the fintech sector they're happy to look at our collateral they're happy to look at sme collateral they're happy to look at um you know property based collateral etc cetera, etc cetera. so and they will take any structure because from their point of view hanging out for some sort of traditional um stream of uh, i suppose coupons with uh, subordination and all the rest of it is putting themselves back straight into the mainstream and they're trying to differentiate themselves. So it's great, you know, we're seeing a combination of the new and the old all coming into the sector. Sure. Thank you, John. Okay, well, um, Richard, um, just looking at the Wingate's recent um, interest or entry into, well, not that recent, but entry into consumer lending, um, looking at your structured note progr programs, could you give a bit of light on that? Could you describe how that works? And also noting that the senior, uh, well, the senior debt is coming from the banks in the structured notes. So how, how do they work? And are they placed externally or does Wingate actually uh, participate in them? Um, <coughs> we, um, like I mentioned it earlier, we, we launched um, our first distribution channel at the end of 2013. So they had the opportunity to originate close to $300 million worth of personal loans. And it's been a, it's been a progression in terms of how we funded ourselves. We, we, we kicked off with the absolute view that, you know, we felt balance sheet lending was the place to be. Um, and so that's how we started off. And so we do um, have uh, bank funding facilities and we're about to roll out our second uh, warehouse, which is uh, quite a large warehouse. And so what we've done in order to maintain capacity within our banking facilities is to turn out into note programs. And so those note programs are made up of um, sophisticated investors um, <coughs> as well as um, some of the Wingate funds, uh, 
these three different funds that have along the way participated. So that was the advantage we had. Having a parent like Wingate is we could actually kick off and, 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 and access funding lines and have some visibility. Um, what we've then uh, progressed to is actually having dedicated institutional programs uh, where we've got, um, uh, you know, each of our programs is, is in a bankruptcy remote vehicle, special purpose vehicle, um, and we've got um, a, um, uh, two different institutions with two separate portfolios of, uh, that they participate in. Um, and, and so as we stand here today, we have 10,000 active customers, and so, you know, that's sort of split up between the different uh, 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 portfolios, and I think we've got um, six different uh, portfolios at the moment. Um, the, the next step in our progression is to go to the securitisa securitisation market. And so, you know, it's, it's a master trust structure. It's getting the warehouse rated and, and going out to, to the securitisation market, which is something we expect to do in the first half of next year. That requires two things, as Keith mentioned. One is you need to have some seasoning and history. And two, you need to have enough volume that you can keep on going back to that market and giving them, giving them paper. But ultimately for us as a business, that's the end game. That's where there is significant liquidity and, and you can get your cost of funds down. In, in, in our game, you know, certainly in, in our focus, we've had a very specific credit appetite, you know, middle income Australia, good credit, wanting to build an uh, institutional grade book for all these reasons so we could progress down this path. Um, and, and that's what we've done, and, and, and that's the journey we're on. Thank you. Speaking of, uh, of securitization, Philippe, um, you have experience in both. You've traded structured debt uh, in the past and also participated in alternative finance markets. Could you just um, uh, share your insights about the difference in these two markets or into these two different funding sources? And also just a follow-up question on your experience in the UK versus Australia. Uh, how do you view Australian development and um, there's a lot of development happening in the UK and how do you see coming here in Australia? Look, um, back in the days, uh, pre-GFC, pre uh, when securitization wa was at its peak, uh, some structured credit trading desks were called F9 monkeys. Um, so I think that gives you uh, a flavor about what was the, the focus of the structured credit investor back then, basically uh, relying, uh, some say excessively, on models, on rating. Um, and in contrast, the alternative uh, finance investor uh, is uh, looking for transparency on the underlying and is trusting the platforms. Uh, to provide the data they, they need to make their decision. Now, in truth, that's a bit of a, a caricature, obviously. Um, the, the investors that have been successful in this asset class over the cycle have developed both skill sets. Uh, they have the, the skill set to, uh, to review and understand the structures, uh, but they also uh, understand the underlying uh, very well. And for some of them, are trading the underlying directly. So uh, there is a, a strong difference in nature between the structured credit or securitization investor and the alternative finance investor, but um, the, the, the boundary are, are more blur. Um, with respect to the, the UK, I think obviously uh, they, they've had very, very strong uh, success uh, in terms of peer-to-peer -peer platform. You know, the, the likes of Funding Circle, uh, Market Invoice, uh, Lend Invest have strong brands uh, and uh, have, have had successes very early on. And I think Australia is trying to, to, to catch up and um, is still looking for uh, some big su successes in that space. I think the challenge is that uh, overseas uh, there's been challenges uh, with respect to peer-to-peer um, -peer, uh, lending and uh, the models have already evolved. So Australia somehow being a bit late to the party needs to uh, uh, be successful at both the sort of providing some peer-to-peer -peer solution, but also providing uh, some balance sheet uh, lending solution to investors. So it's, uh, it's a bit tricky uh, coming late to the cycle after the challenges of the UK and the US. And I think the the, um, the successful lenders will be those who, uh, who can provide uh, different types of 
investment solution to investors. Okay. Okay. Well, we've got about three minutes left. Let's go to the uh, questions from the audience. And, Phil and Philip, I might just um, stick with you on that second question: How long before we see a publicly rated Australian securitization printer? And also, John, Richard, um, can you jump in on if you have a view on that. But um, what, what what's your view on this question? Oh, we haven't seen one already. Uh, I think it's uh, it's imminent. I think uh, define. Um, Publicly, really, I think there'll be some uh, some rating agency that will um, be in that space. I think that you know having one rated uh, vehicle is really not uh, it's an achievement. But what what we really want to see at some point is being able to compare uh, vehicles between uh, different issuers and different asset class in that space. That I think we're quite far away still. Latitude um, in the last year has had three issues. Um, so two credit card and one personal loan issue, I think all up um, nearly $3 billion. So there's a market, it was rated, and uh, it was taken up very well by both Australian and Asian institutions. Okay. Um, the first question, how do alt file lenders react when their funders also support their direct competitors? Um, John, Keith, <laughs> if you outraged. want to voice your view Completely on Completely outraged. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, look, you know, it's, got, it's capital markets and it's, exactly. it's, it's, it's financial markets and it's all everything wrapped into one. I want to know what my competition's doing. Um, as Keith said before, they have amazing flags um, to look across um, structures um, subordination, up and so up and down and side to side in structures, and if you've got that flex and it allows you to enter into a market early um, and, in, uh, and learn from it, then why wouldn't you do that? Yeah, and I, I think that um, clearly we're not a retail business, uh, we're a wholesale business, and just like banks would fund competitors, we see ourselves as funding people in the marketplace. and. Um, you know, we try and do the best thing by um, you know, by each of those those partners. So, yep. Yep. okay. Um, thoughts on LICs or LIT structures as funding source? They're probably a bit still behind on the development of those markets. Yeah, I, I think it, it really just comes down to um, there's there, there's a lot of people interested in funding, but the due diligence also is significant, as you know, and. Um, people want to know everything. If, if, if industry has one advantage, I think, th over our predecessors and, and established, is the level of transparency I've seen in the last um, 15 months is phenomenally higher than... Y we're data companies and, and the advantage we have is we can give data to potential investors at a level that, that the, uh, you know, the banks and the other traditional competitors can't. I think uh, I'd just add to that, um, similar to the, the last question, that um, funding, finance companies, the more successful they are, the more funding they need. And so they're going to continue to need funding um, and as they grow. Um, so they need to look at all these sources and it's not really one or the other. It's, it's basically how do you solve the problem as it evolves, as you grow. Correct. And it's, all, it's, it's, it's really that diversity of funding that the companies require as they grow. Um, maybe just one note on the yeah. listed structure. I think we have to be a bit careful. Sometimes those are those listed uh, vehicles are mean to to solve some problem, but um, they um, they should not uh, give the impression of, of liquidity when there is no such thing. Uh, so you know some asset class uh, basically are illiquid, and investor needs to know that. And sometimes those uh, listed vehicles try to uh, um, tick a box uh, with some investor pretending they offer liquidity where really in the underlying there's none. So I think that can be uh, questionable practice in some areas. Mm. Well, great insights. Thank you, gentlemen. Please join me in thanking the panel. <laughs>